started. Uh, this gentleman's going to be on at 12 5, so I need to get in one quick thing. Welcome, everybody. Much love, much respect. I uh, hope everybody's doing well uh, during this crazy time. It's, it's so great that we have music. Uh, as I've told you guys a couple times before, I grew up in a pretty crazy household, and all I had was music. And I'm just so grateful that, that even now to this day as an adult, that I could still access, I could still be with music. I still have a relationship to music. So anyway, with every adversity comes with it, the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit. So, you know, don't let it hold you back. Just keep moving forward. Keep going up, keep going up, keep going up. So anyway, that being said, real quick, because, uh, you know, we, we, we have some time constraints. Todd Kessler mentioned last uh, two weeks ago, hey, how do I change the key in logic? And dude, you have no idea. These things, they like, they'll, they'll infiltrate my mind like at 11 12 p.m so the other day i kind of worked at it and it's really interesting you can change the entire key of the song which is obvious but if you want to do like a you know a key change like say bar 15 you can't change it over here which i didn't know and so what you have to do is select the pencil tool and there's two ways to do this, but I'm going to show you the first. So you'll select the pencil tool. I never use it, so there it is. And then you want to resize in the global tracks so you can see that this is now separate. You have the time signature and the key signature. So anyway, based now on my bar mode, I'm going to click here with the pencil tool. And now I can change the key. And if you want to disable you know, um, double flats and things like that, you would do that there. But here is the way that you would change the key. So I'm really glad. So let's just say we went to, uh, you know, G major or something and we hit OK. And then you would see that the key chain uh, would happen there. So another way to do it is you want to select the key, hit Command C, you know, place the bar, bar 25, 27, uh, the playhead rather, and then hit Command V. And so these are the two ways to insert key changes inside of logic. So thank you, Todd, for that, for, uh, for haunting me at night. I appreciate it. And, uh, I had completely forgot about it. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> we're, we're always learning, always growing. And, and there's more info here, you know, that, that should be looked at. For example, does it change the behavior of MIDI and the loops? I would assume it does, but this is as far as I got for, for today. So anyway, um, let me see, is Edgar on uh, oh, there he is. Okay, cool. Edgar, welcome to the call. Uh, let me go ahead and just give you an introduction real quick, uh, if you don't mind. Born in Germany, Edgar Rothermich, I hope I'm pr um, pronouncing that properly, studied music at the University of Arts in Berlin and graduated in 1989 with a master's degree in piano and sound engineering. He's worked as a composer, music producer in Berlin, Moved to Los Angeles in 1991, where he continued his work on numerous projects in the music and film industry. Did a bunch of great projects. Um, the Celestine Prophecy, Out Outer Limits, Babylon 5, What the Bleep Do We Know, which was a great movie. Uh, Fuel, Big Money, um, Rustless. For the past 20 years, Edgar has had a successful musical partnership with electronic music pioneering and founding Tangerine Dream member Christopher Frank. Recently, in addition to his collaboration with Christopher, Edgar has been working with other artists as well on his own projects. This guy has done solo albums, uh, absolutely amazing. So he's known as a composer, audio engineer, and, and an author of the best-selling book series, Graphically Enhanced Manuals, with over 17 books, 18 now, 19 probably, for various software applications like Logic Pro, Pro Tools, Final Cut Pro. So anyway, I just wanted to welcome, if you guys could just give him a quick hand just to make sure he's pumped up, unmute yourself. And uh, yeah, I, how's it going, Edgar? So far, so good. Man, thank you for coming. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, we, we're very excited to talk to you. You know, we, we love your work here and um, we love your YouTube channel and everything you've done. I just wanted to know just what you thought of 10.5. You know, I, I would say that you're, you probably above all else know the most about the program in terms of just all the ins and outs. I just wanted to get your thoughts on 10.5. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's as you can see everywhere. It's one of the biggest updates since ten point yeah ten point zero basically, and uh, I think the wait was yeah it was worth the wait because it's almost like a year th since the last major upgrade or you know, significant update, and the amount of new features and the amount of time it takes for the users to wrap their head around and really dig into it and see what they can do with it. Yeah, it takes some time. And even if there's a lot of features, some 
people say, okay, I don't need life loops, I don't need this, I need that. But there's so much stuff in there for everybody. It doesn't matter what kind of workflow, what kind of specifically type of mu music you're doing. So it is tons of stuff to get into. And if you don't do life loops, if you don't do sequencing, uh, step sequencing, if you have time, get your feet wet into it and maybe it widens your horizon. Uh, so it's a it's a big advantage because and let me say that with with the live loops the interesting thing is it's always like Ableton Live so it's marked as or for DJing electronic music a lot of people don't know that many film composers use Ableton Live for their film composing because it's a tool it's not right. a, it's DJing stuff I don't do that stuff that's beyond me this kind of snob mentality is really bad and people <laughs> should really be open. To really, oh, I can use that, and I don't care who else used that, but it works perfectly in my workflow. If I use only five percent, what it's capable of, it's just like keep your mind open and experiment with it, and say, oh, great, that's I can use it perfectly in in my workflow and my type of music I'm I'm doing. Yeah, one of my favorite composers, uh, Cliff Martinez, is on Ableton, and I was I was pretty blown away. Um, what what's your favorite feature, or or some of, of course, um, with ten point five plugins workflows the main thing what of course there's a lot of stuff everything is great but the one thing I was really waiting for was the update of EXS24 and I almost gave it up I said okay will it really happen because all the other plugins around were updated and with this new interface not more functionality but much as like a facelift and you had a few new plugins uh, here and there but EXS24 was dragging along okay will it happen and more importantly, if it happens, how do they do it? And, and I think they did a pretty good job. There's some kind of rough edges with uh, uh, file management here and there, but the main thing they really nailed, in my opinion, is the, the user interface. It is super easy. I mean, if you work with contact, I mean, honestly, off the records, I'm not a big fan of many of the native instruments. I mean, just use, a big thing for me is user interface, because if you work, six, 12 hours on that stuff, it has to make fun somehow. If it's constantly fighting the user interface and it's tiny funds and your eyes are bleeding already and you cannot see that stuff. And now the stuff is uh, with the sampler instrument, uh, with the sampler plugin, I think it's a nice balance between it is big, but n not too monstrous and you can resize it and it's fun. It's right there and you have the VCO, VCA, VCF and all the, the common places few stuff if you're used to EXS24 you have to get used to it but overall I think they did an amazing job and keep in mind that's their first shot it doesn't mean okay that's it doesn't mean that if they get more feedback that they adjust and tweak it a little bit here and there and so I would say so that's basically my main feature then with drum machine designer with the integration of the quick sampler which is kind of the little cousin of the sampler it's it's great because if you if you sit back and see the strategy, it's not that okay here we throw you another bone, another plugin you can play with it. You see that's a bigger strategy on that, and I think that is really refreshing. Besides all that nonsense, logic is dead, and and all this kind of stupid thing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. Not only is it going on, but how is it going on? So you see a direction, and that is kind of encouraging and refreshing in that whole landscape. Yeah, I noticed the drum machine designer in the past, it was really difficult to even do something simple like pitch or, and now it's it's all turnkey because of the quick sampler, right? Yeah, because the, the, the main problem was drum machine designer, the concept again, so they had great idea, but it was 0 0.5 basically. So it was not there yet. And the integration with uh, Ultra Beat was more like a, yeah, a band aid. Ultra beat, okay, great, but it is old technology talking about user interface. I mean, it's like tiny little thing. And it was the writing was on the wall because they didn't upgrade the, the, uh, the ultra beat. Mm. And so they completely, instead of, okay, you have the drum machine designer and, but you have the main plugin and then you have the different audio outputs and which are then aux sense which then goes back to the aux it, it's convoluted and yeah. now it's simple you have as many uh quick sampler or even drum synth and it's straightforward so the complexity and the clutterness get away with it and again what comes in fun so you get in you understand it you can play with it and once the 
if it gets less cluttered and less complex and complicated, then the musicality, the creativity comes in. And that's always the balance to give us tools to play with, but not distract us to some point where we're just fiddling around and we don't get any stuff done. And if you're a film composer, if you're in a series and you have to deliver every week your 20, 30 minutes, you don't have time to really figure out. If stuff doesn't work, you toss it and <laughs> concentrate on stuff that works. Totally. And the developer, they know that. I mean, they get the earful from, from the user, and which is good. So they adjust to this kind of stuff. And if they bring us the fun back, even better. So you do your work, you get the work in time, and having fun, fun while you're doing it, what more can you ask for? Um, oh, of course, of course. I just finished the 10.5, the book that you just released. Uh, man, it's, I definitely had to go over a couple sections, you know, a couple times. And I love how you write the books. Uh, for my brain, Edgar, it makes complete sense. You know, just the detail, the visual aspect of it. I'm so grateful that, that your work is out there. Uh, I've read all your books. Like, I just love them. I love all your, your content, uh, your YouTube, uh, YouTube channel, which, uh, by the way, uh, Robert, is, is a YouTube channel in the chat? What is hey, the name of it? One sec. Okay, cool. Um, the name of your YouTube channel is? Music Tech Explained. Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, that's my bad, Robert. I, I said it was something else. Okay. Uh, anyway, this guy, uh, just wonderful mind, great mind. I just wanted to know, how did you get started writing the books? I'm just fascinated how the whole thing even got started because you've been uh, you know, a, a help to a lot of people. So I just want to know how did this journey even got started. Actually, it's a similar story like with a lot of things where like, for example, a lot of de software developers, they don't fall out of the bed in the morning and say, okay, I create that XYZ app. So <laughs> they create the app for themselves and then they figure out, oh, other people have this, the same problem and then they make it available. And it was similar with, with that concept because uh, you mentioned because I started in 1989, 1990 with Christopher Frankie. And if you're somewhat familiar with Tangerine Dream and the arsenal of synth, what they had at dis their disposal. So that was basically my challenge because when I, uh, Christopher Franke offered me the job that if I want to work with him as a uh, producer, engineer and co-composer, then I get the key to the kingdom basically. I walked in the studio and just so you guys know, if you haven't seen the picture, Tangerine Dream, they had a, their studio in Berlin was a little movie studio. So they get a little studio uh, a room where they packed in all their synthesizers and the equipment, all the stuff where they did all the solo albums, most of the solo albums and the um, feature films. So whenever they did the stuff for Michael Mann, so they flew over to Berlin. So they were sitting in the studio with the director, what we did later also for uh, Universal Soldier. So to sit in the studio and work with the compo uh, with the director and doing all that stuff. So that studio, that little uh, movie theater was packed with synthesizers. So when I agreed, okay, I work uh, for him, I was confronted with a pile of manuals, everything with cork, MOOC, whatever. And if you ever had the pleasure to read a Roland or a cork manual, which was translated from Japanese back into English. I mean, even then reading it, me as a German, try to understand that Japanese English kind of thing. Uh, it was like, what do you mean doing that knob and this? It was like pain. And then also the amount of um, of devices I had to learn. So there were no YouTube, there were no Mac Pro Video and all the other stuff, lynda.com, whatever. So you really have to go through the, all the manuals which were basically written just like novels. So when no screenshots, barely, okay, you have like a little bit of the, the front panel, but it was really hard to go through. And the other problem, and I'm sure most of you guys know that, if you work on a project, on a movie project, sometimes you have a project for work for a month, two or three months, and it's like more an acoustic thing. Then you have more an electronic thing. So sometimes you are working a lot with Melodyne and then for the next half year you don't work with Melodyne so you work with all the plugins we have orchestral samples and then the next project you have to go to back to Melodyne and say oh wait a minute how did that work so the amount of devices and tools we have to deal with nowadays and the depth of each individual is so yeah it's overwhelming so your brain cannot really I mean you have limited a memory you can go to the 
uh, Best Buy and get you another memory chip and no you forget that shit from before and now we have to rememorying that stuff and the, then they have the problem early on with that situation so what I did for myself I always wrote notes so whenever I read a book a manual I made my notes for the whole thing so when I have to revisit uh, a specific device I didn't read the manual I go over my notes and what I always did with notes is I read a paragraph or a couple of pages so I didn't write it down so I try to comprehend what that oh that's how it means and if you study as a sound engineer you learn how to read signal flow diagrams so even any kind of plugins any kind of thing I always try to comprehend and extract that the functionality as a um, signal flow diagram okay here it goes in then that happens and you press that button this and that so whenever you have to revisit a program you don't have to re read 10 20 50 pages you look at your diagram and so this is oh okay good get it and your memory refreshes much faster and one thing you don't have usually is time so you don't have the time okay I get the weekend and I'm gonna read that 500 pages book anyway no you don't you have half an hour or maybe an hour and then go through okay good and then you're on the next queue and you have to do that and so over the years so I had all these scripts and the stuff and when we switched to logic which I came actually late back in uh, late in the game I think it was 2005 we switched uh, we came in with logic we, we switched from Cubase uh, I think it was logic pro 7 so right after uh, uh, Apple took over and I actually wrote the manuals back then on the uh, on the computer and made it available as PDF files to the community uh, community for free. Horrible English when it was even worse than it was uh, back then. And so these were my first pre-manuals that I stepped into the Apple community and David Damani. So when he created the um, the Logic User Group, so I remember we had the first meeting in the, in the Valley with one of the Apple representatives so they get that thing off the ground and he introduced me to some of the Apple guys and so this was kind of the manual what I did made available back then on my website was before the graphically enhanced manuals and then over the years so I just uh, yeah made them better and then made more like commercial um, product out of it well not only do I love and I only have a few more questions and I'm gonna let some of these um, fine folks to talk to you and ask you some questions but not only do I love the the descriptions, the visuals, the illustrations, but I love the lessons because you'll talk about things like like pan law, right? Remember we were, and and you go into you know in depth, kind of the entire aspect of it, synthesis, for example, which is something that I'm continuously working on, and you 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 know in and out. So yeah, I just I just wanted to say a personal thank you, um, mm -hmm. and super grateful for your work. Um, l let me just ask you one question, and I'll let these. Um, find folks take over here so i just wanted to know like just based on you know what you've seen and and now the new developments with all the 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 daws where do you see music going uh in terms of genres or, or production as a whole i'm just curious like your take on music and, and where it's going is it just going to be more electronic or um actually when you talk about music not like music production i I'm a little bit worried, honestly, because we see a kind of thing going in two directions. On one side, we see all these great tools, they become available, so we don't need a $100,000 budget to actually create a note. On the other hand, which is good and also a curse, you don't need to know an instrument which is also a very dangerous uh, development so I don't get into discussion if you consider a DJ a musician or not that's a different topic altogether but it is on the music side it's a little bit more refreshing what I hear with the news that from the from the retail point of view that last year they never the, the amount of guitars and drums and instruments are sold are going up like crazy so that's kind of refreshing that through all this technology okay you just have a couple of loops and you make some kind of music and some people get to a dead end right away and say okay that's not it I want to create more than just press a button and trigger someone else's loop that is a good part the thing what I mean with worried about is that music get devaluated extremely and that hurts a lot of musician composers and if you check out because <laughs> the funny thing is because I'm teaching at Loyola and we had 
one of our senior classes so we have one assignment for each uh, student they have to do a producer profile and this is kind of an interesting thing because I get a lot of information which I wouldn't delve into this type of music what some of the kids are doing but one kind of frightening trend is now with uh, the loops and stuff so it's not like people working on the album or on their music and they polish it and they bring it out as a thing there's some weird trend that producers want to uh, produce or whatever they call that produce quantity quantity have to loops this and beats this and beats that and that is kind of I don't understand because it's not the point to have two million beats out there and even like one of the the advertising even on my on my channel on the YouTube channel I saw that a company that advertised okay 1200 chord progression and they advertised in the first sentence you don't need to understand chord progression put it in and then oh wow cool this and you have to know what a G7 and a minor chord is and augmented and all this stuff so you don't have to know drums you just load in the loops you load in now the chord progression and everything is there how it ends up with the content ID on YouTube that's a complete different mess on the legal kind of side but the main thing I'm worried about is this devaluation because if so much music comes in it devaluates the music the producers are not putting up the money to pay a composer if everything is out there the quality threshold goes down anyways not even talk about live musician and budgets and all this stuff so that is a little bit good thing music becomes available it's a democratization of music and a lot of stuff comes out Billie Eilish I mean she would not even be possible to be on the landscape uh, even five ten years ago and it's refreshing and it doesn't even matter if you like the music or not but it's important to push other genres and other influences it's like uh, cross-pollination of different styles but the thing the music industry have to be careful with this flooding of too much stuff because people don't understand where the quality is and that quality factor that suffers and we who try to make a living with music and not like as a side job and putting that something out that cuts into a little bit of that in that field so mm. that's my little concern about that i hear you i hear you well let me let uh, a couple of these folks ask some questions who would like to go hands <laughs> i'll go okay Edgar, you said you teach at Loyola in Chicago? Uh, no, here at Loyola Marymount. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I agree with you a lot. Uh, I don't have, I was, I think my question that I had for Eddie is about signal flow because one thing I never understood in logic was the environment window. Yeah. And I was curious if you could help learn about that. I, I came to logic a long time ago. Uh, I think it was 2003 because I studied actually at the brother school to you at Hans Eisler. And, um, I, uh, a lot of my friends were using Logic, but I, I, I think my problem was the EXS, I just was so lost with it and my songs always just sounded cheap. So I kind of got overwhelmed and when you bought it, I had this book that was like this big, you know, to read through and I never was going to do it. So your books definitely helped out with learning, but signal flow was always like my weakest thing. Uh, and so I don't know, maybe it's too technical to do on the web platform, but if you have any resource to kind of dive into it, um, I would love that. Yeah, that's an interesting point with the environment because there's this, um, okay, so let me put it that way. The One of the reasons why we switched from Cubase in 2005 to Logic, two things so first thing was the reason why I never liked logic honestly from the beginning because I didn't like the user interface and when Apple came over it well, only it was kind of encouraging okay there's a big money behind it so that it's like a forward-looking kind of thing but the first thing what they did was to change the user interface I said wow so now I can actually look at it uh, that I like and I said before like I need something and in, in joy factor when I work constantly on this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. I like that so I can look at that 12 hours a day and this was the one thing but the main thing with logic was really the convincing factor that none of the other programs Cubase, Protos, whatever had this customization availability like uh, Pro Tools, uh, like logic sorry 
because every like f coming from from Cubase or Pro Tools, you can do a lot of stuff. But if you're a film composer, then you have your workflow, you have your specific needs, and you concentrate on that and do want to, oh I want to have this here I want to have one mixer part just for the for the playback and I need to click over here oh sorry can't do that and logic is so so open based on the environment so that was the key factor but having said that the the interesting part what Apple did because being open and this whole thing but object oriented which get a little bit lost because a lot of people don't uh, understand that but that's the underlying concept of logic that it's object oriented none of the other project uh, the other DAW is doing that and what do you mean by that object oriented is that everything in logic is considered an object for example the main thing a lot of uh, logic users don't understand that the difference the main difference between track and a channel strip and I really go very deep, not deep and I really spend some time in my books to make sure to understand that basic concept that once you understand the difference between a track and a channel strip in the uh, how uh, logic sees that then you understand the concept of logic and if you glance over that you get into trouble all the time like to understand why do I have multiple tracks which go into one channel strip if you come from Cuba as a Pro Tools they don't understand that makes no sense but if you backtrack because nowadays the younger generation that come into this DAW environment as a de facto thing they grew up with it they don't have the historical uh, relationship where that stuff coming from the DAW didn't fall from the sky it comes from a studio and a studio has that's usually I always ask my, my student okay what are the two main furniture in a recording studio that's the mixing board and the multi-track tape deck which most people don't haven't seen that but that whole concept from the 40s 50s 60s 70s with multi-track that whole concept you have a mixing board and you have that's where you create the sound and you have the storage device the tape deck these are the two main components in the studio so a DAW mimics that environment and creates that with software but once you understand that then you know you have these two elements the track and the channel strip and both have two different purposes and the channel channel strip mimics the um, the mixing board the mixing console mm -hmm. so once you understand that you have the mixing console one part of the furniture that doesn't store a sound but it only creates the sound even on the way in or on the way out when you mix it so it's only processing and then you have the other big furniture the, the 2432 multi-track that is the storage device which is nowadays the hard drive and whatever you have there so if you look at any DAW, you look at the track and the track lane, I see a multi-track machine. But if you don't come from that thing, then you see, okay, that's a device on a, an element of the software uh, instrument. And object-oriented means logic deals with these different objects. A track is an object. A channel strip is a separate object. And what you do is you assign a channel strip one object to another object and therefore the track and the channel strip becomes one which is basically in Cubase Pro Tools if you create a track it's the same thing you create a channel strip you use the same terminology in logic you have to be careful because a track is a different thing than a channel strip they get assigned to it and then you create a, um, a region another project uh, another object which is contained in the track and then the MIDI events is another object which is contained in the region. So basically we have just files, folders, another folders and folders and folders, basically like a software hierarchy. And that's how you have to uh, look at this kind of thing and then you understand that. And the environment is basically like the missing link. That's the thing in the background which lets you connect that. Because uh, other DAWs, like I said, you have project and uh, you have a, a track but you have when you create a track you have to des decide do you create a, a MIDI track or an audio track or whatever and that's that's it in logic you create a track and it's gonna be whatever you want you can put MIDI events a uh, MIDI region on it you can audio region on it if it makes sense it's a different story but it's an open object oriented system and the environment before 
I think a couple of years before you had to create a track, you had to create it in the environment. And over the years, Logic made it more less complicated by putting the, the environment more and more in the background. And now you can operate Logic without even knowing that the environment exists. But yeah. if you want to do <clears throat> some specific stuff, you can still go into the environment. So it depends. So let's put it that way. So you don't have to know anything about the environment. You don't have to know about it. You have to, don't have to learn it. But if you, as I said before, you can open it and look, okay, what, did, what does it do? And then see what are my needs? And then you can see, okay, great. I can create a mixer just with the channel strips I need and assign a window. Put that as a uh, um, um, specific window on a second monitor, on a third monitor, whatever. And you can customize your setup. And then it makes sense, which is not possible with any other because you open the mixer that is your mixer mm -hmm. and which, uh, you real, have... real quick editor, on which one of your books do you cover the 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 environment is it uh uh that's how... in the details book details because that's the thing because when i started i dis, uh, divided the two in the logic um, pro 10 how it works where to uh, cover all the basic um, concepts and the main features and then when you want to dive more into environment and score and all the other stuff, then I put that in the in the details book. And so that's the reason because both together there would be over a thousand pages. So it's like overwhelming for a, a user because not everybody needs the environment. You don't need to score and all sort of stuff and uh, control surface and all this kind of thing. So that's why I put that in the separate book. So Logic uh, Pro 10, how it works, it's like the starter and the details is more like into the yeah as it says into the detail stuff and then you can really pick out what kind of thing if you're more into scoring you can read up that if you're using more uh control surfaces you can uh, read up on the other um on the different chapters so you got a lot of reading to do dvp i, st I still haven't gotten through the first book all right <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me take another one because i want to i want to make sure this man gets back to his life eltic is Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Edgar. Thank you so much for your time today. Can you talk about <clears throat> your your journey from the time that uh, you you got your degree? And uh, I think I understood uh, Eddie to say it was in piano and I think recording engineering or something of that nature. But what led you to move from there into becoming a composer? And what was that transition like in terms of uh, learning how to orchestra, uh, get into orchestration and laying out uh, compositions for film or TV? Um, it is actually not like, okay, like a switch. Okay, now I do this and I do that. So it was just like a gradual thing. Like most people, I mean, when I was a teenager, I started with my band when I was 14. We did cover bands and we played English songs, American bands without even knowing what the words mean. So we did really like phonetic stuff. Then later, 14, 15, 17, we did jazz rock at my band. So I pretty much tried to imitate everything. Chick Corea, uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra, this kind of thing, jazz rock era. That where we uh, my focus on and we did original stuff. So I c composed all the the songs for my band. So but this was not film music. When I went to uh, Berlin, it fits into that because nowadays a lot of recording studios, they are just sound engineering courses. Either you have like a crash course in Logic, uh, in Pro Tools, you get a certificate and hope to get a job. Uh, the thing what I did in Germany, that's a seven year program. That's only, there are only two universities in Germany that are doing that and I think one in Austria. And their focus is completely different because what you do there is you have a complete music study. So you learn your uh, piano, sight reading, everything you study with the same musicians uh, who study their uh, piano to be like a concert pianist, whatever, then you study the technical part, uh, electronics, acoustics with uh, techie guys or the thing. You sit there and your head explodes because you have no idea what is that. So you get both studies there and in, in, the, in the university, then you have your recording studio, uh, you record the orchestra, you record all the bands, all the stuff. So it's like this synergy that's going on. So it's always the recording, the technical part and the music. And from the background of having my own band, 
creating composing my own songs so I always create music and then in Berlin with other contacts and then I started to create film music which is like a natural power okay you create music and now we create music to film or to picture and so that was always there so it's not only like the technical part it's almost this technical and musical thing and that comes in very handy nowadays because if you the main um, challenge what we and most of the DAW composer whatever doesn't matter what you call it we have to be everything if you wind back 20 years ago you composed your song as a film composer then you had your musician they play your stuff then you go to the recording studio you have your recording engineer he records your thing if you put it out on a CD you have the mastering engineer everybody has a job and if you have a manager they do the advertising and all that stuff now we have to do everything in the same as one person and it's insane and because if you doesn't matter what kind of DIW you purchase if you come from music background you have to know how to set up a, a compressor a frequencer to know what a pan law is most people are completely overwhelmed they don't know that and what's even worse they they get the I the idea that you watch a couple of YouTube videos and then you are a sound engineer and then now you're not and then you see the all the discussion now oh you need a mastering engineer and there's so much nonsense out there on the internet and down to the point okay click this button and this one or this like preset and then it's mastered they people discussing about mastering have no clue what mastering engineer is where it comes from what it does and I cannot blame that but it's really if you have that background and see have a little bit knowledge of that and it's really not no guys no that's not how it works and it's so much misinformation to a lot of people they need that information they don't have the money the time to go to school to learn all that and they rely on the internet so it's like a, a tricky part and not even talk about putting your stuff how to get on Spotify on iTunes and your social media and legal stuff complete different nobody has a uh, music uh, lawyer what comes in with the whole uh, copyright thing I mean it's like too much with that whole thing and because I'm coming from that background I have the advantage that I'm fortunate enough to have a little bit more detailed information of that and a little bit of uh, experience with that and but from my um, um, career so I get automatically into that from the music from the sound engineering from the production and the key element for me was like this typical thing you have to be at the right time at the right place and that happened to me in 1988 when I met Christopher Frankie and so that's when he left Tender and Dream and took a year off and then came back and decided to do his solo career so that was the time when I was finished with my study I worked in his studio before, did some recording while with some of his friends and so a couple of pieces they fall into place and that's where he offered me the job if I was interested to work with him first in Berlin and we did like two or three movies, uh, uh, American movies so we fly back and forth New York and Los Angeles and then in 91 he asked me that he decided to move to Los Angeles and if you want to come with him and relocate at the beginning it was just for we planned to go half a year to stay in LA and half a year in Berlin but then it turned out now you have to be in LA uh, full-time to be available to uh, the business and yeah and this was 1991 and so I'm stuck here in LA <laughs> since then and so the film music was then a natural thing so most of the time I was producing for for Christopher and later on also co-composing with him and did my own stuff but it was a natural kind of uh, thing to go and the same thing with the, with the books it was also a natural thing because I did that all the way along and now because of the music devaluation because the money that comes in is not as good as it was 10 years ago with movie of the week and royalties and all that stuff and now it's just like insane out there uh, to really make a living and with the uh, books was kind of thing because I had that already planned and a couple of things fell into place with PayPal and uh, self-published author and all that stuff that I could really start that and that's my advantage that I really 
create everything myself. I don't have a publisher, which is sometimes a problem, but it gives me the freedom. I'm much faster of putting out there, I don't have to do this and wait and for the proof from the cover, okay, is it too yellow, is it too blue, and then committee meeting, all that stuff. No, if I'm finished my last word, I click save and an hour later it is online. And if I made a mistake, I made the mistake and put up the, on, uh, the update the file and, and that's it. So again, the internet sort of gives me the flexibility on that to really find my niche on, on, yeah, in the market. How do you develop your orchestration chops in terms of understanding how to score for strings and brass and so on? How, what did you do to develop your chops there? That is a lot of learning by doing a lot of listening. Um, see, the thing what I see, a lot of handicap with people, and I tell you an example, we had one intern uh, in our studio once, so he helped us with some uh, recording and stuff, and also from uh, to some smaller uh, cues. And for example, so, he's, so he, he came from like rock musician. And then there was something, okay, do a rock song, and but the producer want to have, uh, they have to be an oboe or something. And so he could not mix that because he never heard basically an orchestra. He didn't know how to sound like an, uh, an oboe sound. The same way the other way around. When I started in Berlin, people who are coming from the classical music, they if you give them a snare to mix the snare, to arrange that, they have no clue because they don't have the experience. So a lot of stuff is to do it, it has to you have to know how it sounds like. So if you've never been in an orchestra in a in a concert hall, if you never listen to a live orchestra, you cannot create an orchestra sound. Yes, you can download some sample and they are already nicely mixed. But if you have the French horn and you never sit in a good uh, auditorium and you know the distance and you know about depth and then all of a sudden you get a mix where the French horn are sitting on your lap. And this is like Im impossible because you know that it has to sound that it comes from far back then. The same thing with the the timpani or whatever, whatever you have to do in order to create that in the mix is a different story. But if you don't even know in the first place how it sound, where it has to go to, then you could have all the plugins in the world and you still can make it sound right. So to your answer your question, so that is the whole thing. So being exposed to that music and then know the difference. Also like there's a difference if you have a classical music and uh, a symphony and you have the same orchestra playing a cue for an action movie. The sounds, the string, the horns, everything is different mix. It's much more drier. If you get a couple of times the, the cues coming back from the dubbing station, stage because you had too much reverb and the dubbing mix, the mixer cannot fit it in because you made a nice Disney Hall concert sound and if one helicopter, five machine guns and there is your mix gone and you don't hear anything. So you have to adapt and that's what I say, learning by doing. So you're doing that and you're doing that now for 25, 30 years. That's what you learn or you go to school, USC, whatever, and then film composing. That's where you learn this thing in the fast pace. But back then there were no such thing to, to learn that. It's actually learning by doing and how you survive a machine gun battle with helicopter and you still want to have your music come through. So that's, you figure that out over time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's take, just take two more, is that okay, Edgar? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay, all right. Let's real, real quick, if I can, Ed, I don't necessarily have a question for Edgar. I just wanted to jump on and tell you, thank you for your content. Thank you for what you've provided. You have definitely helped me learn a lot of things through your content. So I just wanted to tell you, thank you. Uh, and introduce myself. My name is Jacques Franco, and I definitely appreciate the stuff you put out because you you definitely have some of the best content out there on Logic. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, David. Um, I, you mentioned uh, how I, I'm sorry if anybody else wants to ask a question. That's fine. I can stop. But I, you were talking about how uh, film composers use Ableton loops, and um, I just did over the weekend for the first time my first film score for this Westworld competition that they were doing with Spitfire and mm -hmm. um and I was just it was so I, I had like it was the hardest thing I did with lining up 
musical changes because sometimes I couldn't figure out how to do things without shifting my whole arrangement. So I was curious if you have any information on how how film, like for film composing, people use the loop. I mean, it just baffles my mind. Yeah, it's that's what I mentioned before. It is a tool because uh, if you sit back and look at the doesn't matter if it's a plugin or a separate DAW, it's a tool so you try to do something. Because sometimes if you have a score, it's pretty much set exactly what you do. Okay, it's a score and the whole thing. But if you have a freedom to develop something and then you dive in, doesn't matter if it's modular synth or whatever, to refine learning by doing because you don't know where the, the journey, where you end up because you have a blank slate and you're just trying something. And that's, uh, for example, the, uh, what the bleep do we know? That's, for example, the, that's where we tried, we used uh, uh, the Reason back then and we used uh, Ableton. So even if we used, I think it was still Cubase back then. So we had Cubase and so, but we also had the uh, Ableton Live, not because we want to do DJ stuff, but we find out, okay, that's some stuff that we couldn't use in Logic. So we just use it as a separate thing. The same thing like use it as a musician. Because mm -hmm. if you have a music session and then you invite the musician, okay, play that solo here and then, okay, that drum, that's exactly what you do. So you assign purpose to the different uh, software. And the same thing like we had a uh, reason that we didn't use a reason because we used uh, uh, Cubase back then, but there were some sounds and some plugins. And so we just import that back in. So we synced it up and MIDI in out and all that, that fun stuff in order to get that specific sound. And a lot of, for example, what the bleep do we know? A lot of sounds that we used back then with some of the sounds that came from Reason that we hooked up and or other thing with, uh, with Ableton Live. So it's really like as a tool. And now with Logic it is, because now it's embedded in, it is actually a little bit more complicated because once you have two elements, it is easier because you have one thing and you can sync up the second component if you don't need it and then you don't sync it up. If for example now you have the workspace on the right and the live loops grid on the left, one thing I guess a lot of people are going to have a hard time to wrap their head around live loops and the timeline because that is a little bit complicated and it also again I come from my own experience because when I first saw that and I said okay great and then you come with a specific knowledge and so it works different so you have to understand so that whole thing that little detail that you have the time you have the ruler on the workspace but there's no ruler on the right side that the 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 combination of the life loops and the workspace again so that is a really complicated thing that you have to understand first to wrap your head around it otherwise a lot of people are oh, 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 that doesn't work and that's thing no because you don't take the time to understand what happens because the then once you understand that the light the timeline the playhead has to move because that is your timeline that is your clock that the loop is referring to that is relying on otherwise it doesn't work and so that's the thing if you work on both then you have to first make sure that you understand that otherwise it gets confusing the whole thing because you start stop and it's here but once you understand and then you things open up it's amazing and and one example because I just get a one uh, on the forum I had a uh, discussion with one guy because he said I cannot use uh, automation with life loops it doesn't work that's crap blah 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 this kind of thing I said no no step back you have to understand that automation you have two automation, you have track automation, you have region automation. Track automation is based on the track and remember we talked about the track and the channel strip. Track means track is based on a timeline. The same thing you have a, 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 a tape, you have a tape there is a, a position on every uh, along the way. So that's what you have on the on the on the track lane. So the whole concept is, okay, how do I record automation in my life loops? That's the wrong question. You didn't understand the concept because that's not possible. Track automation happens in the workspace because it's on a timeline, but you can use the, the, the loops. So if you start your loops, then the loops go along the timeline. So if that track, 
of the uh, where you have a specific loop if that encounters let's say at five minutes where you put down the volume your live loop will go down in volume not because the track automation is part of the live loops of that thing it is part of the track in the workspace so you have to understand that and then you realize oh there's the second thing you have the region automation region automation is part of the region timeline and a live loop is nothing other than a container that contains one or multiple region and each region can contain we talk about media region can contain MIDI events again a different object and automation region automation is nothing other than another object similar to MIDI events but it's called fader events and that is automation but that is embedded in the region timeline so you understand so that is it sounds complicated but this is the time you have to take to understand the concept because once you understand oh that's then you can start and really use the feature otherwise you're constantly struggling get frustrated and if you take the time invest the time then you understand it and then you can actually use it and then put stuff in it and then it gets amazing hopefully that answers that question <laughs> you talked yeah. about you talked about panel a couple of times I, I was wondering what your take is if you're if you're summing down a mix Mm -hmm. and you have some stereo tracks mm -hmm. do you have a take on panning those each full left and right or running them center uh which uh which tracks you talk about if you're if you if you if you're if you're doing a mix if you have say 10 you you finished your song and you're going to sum it down to two tracks and yep. you're running the mix you're mixing it down and you have a couple of stereo tracks mm -hmm. do you have a take on whether you should be panning those stereo tracks left and right or running them both center, the left and right channel of that stereo track? That, yeah. yeah, that's a great question because I get that is one of the key things also I do constantly with the students because the, the way you phrase your question, that is already the problem. Because what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing so often is everything is now so technical, everything is about, okay, should I put it here? Should I put it there? Should I click here? Should I put it more up there? That is not the question. And there is no cookie cutter because the, my, it is fun because most of the time my answer to students is it depends. That's my most used answer. It depends because I understand that. And I see the internet and forums all the time, how I do this, how I do that. Um, it depends because there is no single answer because when, when you ask me that question, the, the proper, answer would be it depends because it depends what it is and more importantly what i mean with it depends um, uh, the approach of mixing what i see a big problem is people throwing plugins over plugins and i see that also with the students and they forget about the basic thing i mean i don't know if you guys ever heard about the 20 minutes uh, mix challenge and some fun stuff with what engineers are doing and i do that also with my student i give them a mix and i say okay Everybody has one minute and the clock is counting. And you have to do in one minute, make a mix. That means what you do, you don't have time to load in 50,000 plugins. No, you have to do the basic mix and mix is what is the balance. And before you do that, what is your stereo position? Because when you make a mix, a mix is the, uh, the loudness. What is the balance between the different uh, signals? Where do you put the signal from left to right, the spatial thing? And then you have the depth and you have the frequency response. So where do you set the frequency to have not everything is in the center at the same frequency and it sounds like like this. So you use all these dimension left, right, front to back and frequency to get that transparent mix. And once you come up with, uh, you approach your mix with that uh, ideas, then you would almost answer your question yourself. For example, it, uh, like I said, so you asked me, where do you put, I have a stereo mix, where I put it? I, my answer would be, it depends. Next question is, what track is it? If you have two stereo, if you have two keyboard tracks, both are recorded in stereo, and the, they're in itself great sound, but it doesn't do the mix any good if you just put the fader up, you would most likely use your, lose your stereo of both uh, keyboards, tracks, 
and put one maybe more to the left more to the to the right so to get a wider stereo track so that is the thing so it's not about what do i do with stereo tracks to a panther left or right it depends on the mix what is the purpose in the mix that dictates how you create that and once you add that decision making then you can say okay what are my options do i have a stereo track and i have the old stereo balance or do i have a stereo pan and i think it was 10.4.5 or earlier when logic finally introduced a stereo pan before you had only a stereo balance and you had to understand when you move left and right the only thing what you do you didn't put anything in this in the <clears throat> in the panorama you just lower the left or the right channel <clears throat> and now with a stereo pan you can actually pan if you have a stereo signal you can decrease your stereo width and then position the stereo width that you have left or right so if you have a stereo signal you for example one option would be I don't know how uh, if it would apply but for example you could narrow the stereo width because if it's one stereo channel then you might want to use the whole stereo width. if you have two then you would just stack them so it doesn't give you any advantage in the stereo balance so in that case you would narrow the stereo balance of each one and then pan the stereo balance as it is one to the left or to the right so in, you know in the if you right click on the stereo control uh, on the pan control you see the the two options stereo I think called stereo balance and pan control and if you set it to pan control you have your pan control is different so if you move up and down you change the stereo balance and if you click exactly on the uh, on the ring and move up and down you decrease the uh, the stereo width and that's a little detail and that factors in into the whole pan law but but you see again so it's a lot of technical stuff that it's to some extent is necessary because once you understand that and then you have the tools available to actually use them in a mix and not like a lot of people doing they go internet youtube okay it's one thing okay put it here put it there and what they do is they put it here and there and it might be completely the wrong advice for their specific reason because it depends on your thing so instead of collecting a lot of cookie cutter solutions that might or might not apply to your situation you have to try to learn and what I always say learn and understand once you understand the concept then you can apply it to your situation how it depends on your situation and that's where you make your mix great and what you just did in that mix that is your knowledge and experience that you apply for the next mix and the mix after that any kind of five minutes YouTube video tell you okay click that button that doesn't bring you any further in your uh, ability and in your skill level so that's basically what, what I mean yeah okay that was a great answer mm -hmm. okay did, did you say that I didn't hear that I'm so sorry I had to mute it. Oh, uh, it's never an easy answer, right? You always have to research. Uh, any final questions here before we let this gentleman go? Good. All right. Well, hey, thank I'll, you. I'll ask one more if we got time. Uh, it's up to him. I, I'll let him. No, no problem. I don't go anywhere. Last one. Last one. Here we go. Okay. And um, what's your approach to uh, selecting what type of libraries you would use with all of the different uh, sample libraries that's out there to assist in the scoring process? Do you have some that you really feel are realistic, that you find intuitive? Uh, what are your thoughts on some of the libraries and, and how they can be used from your standpoint? I haven't checked the most recent one, but it's pretty easy because the, it all starts with what are your needs and of course your budget that's you can't overlook the funny thing is from my experience mixing the stuff is the best mix I got is not if you pick on one library of course your budget always uh, dictates uh, how much stuff you can afford but a lot of times in most of the mix what we did we layered sounds I mean that goes a little bit deeper in the 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 problem with 
sample sounds and what you do and actually if you play that and the voicing that's a whole different topic and how natural it sounds or why it sounds synthy and not like a real orchestra what are the really tricks to achieve that but the funny thing is even when we had the Vienna Orchestra and all the East West and all the stuff in most of the mixes I always had one string which was from a, a Roland 770 sampler which we sampled way back then into the EXS24 and almost all the mixes are always mix that in because what you have in a real orchestra is you have multiple instruments different Stradivarius or whatever they create that sound and if you create if you use one sample library it sounds great but then you go into articulation because it depends on what you compose and how good the articulation sounds and then you have to do some trickery with layering to make it more lush and to trick uh, the whole thing the ear so then it's really more the question how it sounds and not how you would do it like if you have four instruments you take four samples now if you take six samples you can cheat around but it sounds like that depending on the phrasing then there's a lot of gray area but basically to your question is the quality of the sample library is amazing it's almost you cannot really go wrong like with the early archive thing they were they were really limited from the sound quality it's more like you have to see okay what's the budget what you actually need do you need 2000 articulation or you really need one good sustain and one good uh, Mercato sound and you don't even have the time to fiddle around with all the stuff if you have like 10 different piccolo flute articulation do you really need that so and if the library provides different kind of packages so you don't have to pay a lot of money f which you use only 10 percent so that's more the wise decision how to approach w what you purchase on that and important so really so don't restrict yourself that okay i use only that library if you have one library or even a cheap even the, the the factory sounds i mean in in logic i mean studio strings it, it's amazing you don't spend a dime on any additional library how far you can go with that stuff and if you can afford to have a different library because it extends your sound layer them and see does it work or does it sound unnatural or something that has the effect and you're not composing most of the time a full hour symphony you have a specific cue and you want to have an effect for that cue and you can cheat in order to get that effect out of it and the producer will never ask you what library did you use did you use two layers or three layers he asks you does it sound incredibly good yes you get the next job congratulations so that's how it works good stuff thank you mm -hmm. well thank you for your time edgar so grateful for you and your work uh, i'm gonna go ahead and, and send all the links to all the members here and just, mm -hmm. just want to say a big thank you have a great week we appreciate your time Okay, you too. And good luck to everybody. And stay safe. Thank, Thank you, you very much. See you guys. Bye. <laughs> Eddie. Yeah. You are the man, my brother. Thank you. You are the man. <laughs> Appreciate that. Hey, man, I just want to, I care, you know. I don't know how else to tell you, man. I care. Um, I think about it. Like, you know, Todd asked me that question two, three weeks ago. And... You know, I care. Like, I don't know how else to say it, man. But yeah, expect more. Expect platinum uh, producers. Expect uh, f expect more. Cool. Thank you, Dude, that that guy is a is a wealth of knowledge. Man. Oh, geez. That, was, that dude is <laughs> man, dude. It's wow. hard. Listen, it, it, I it's know. Just, he, he's so next level. It's like, okay, hold on. I need to just stop for a second here. It's amazing. He's phenomenal, man. Even when he just broke down the tracks and the chat, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. A lot of stuff went over my head, but it was good to hear. <laughs> but, it's, but it starts like this, and, and you're just, yeah. you know, fertilizing the soil. Uh, Jock, to, yeah. I, want to, I want you to email him personally, Jock, please. Okay? I'll do that. I, I will, I'll hit you up after this. Okay, good. I'll hit you up. Yeah, uh, I'm going like to check everybody's I... emails and everybody's songs. Please prepare for Beth. Uh, there's no timeline. There's no deadline, but it's a phenomenal connection. So please, um, I'll get back to you, Todd, and it is about that. And, and uh, Angelina, you should be submitting 1,000%. Which song you choose right is up now. to you. If you need my help, let me know. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So we'll... on the project behind me right now. So just actually 
trying to get it actually mixed. The version I sent you wasn't mixed. It was just uh, everything you I sent cracked. me sounded great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, seriously, no joke. <laughs> really, really good. I wouldn't flatter you. I really mean it. Two questions, Eddie. Thank you. Shoot. Um, with the with the first league for the folk where you reference Ed Sheeran and uh, Adele, uh, is it is it de definitely all vocals, no instrumentals? You, you can submit the instrumentals, but you, you your probability of getting a placement goes up like eighty percent. But still, just just send it, just send it. Gotcha. Just send it. Like like Todd's gonna get placed. I'm telling you right now. I don't know if it's going to take them two months or from your mouth to God's ears, my friend. <laughs> no, I'm t I, 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 I don't guarantee much, but I guarantee that you will get. And by the way, this is a contingent on if you send a couple of songs, if you send one song, I can't guarantee it. But if you send, let's call it five or something. That's part of my email. So okay. yeah. Yeah. I got you. I'm going to do that today. I'm just uh, finishing my publishing deal it is second question. Same question. Is there anybody in on the team that can sing in that genre for, uh, uh, the bicycle rebel motorcycle club. Yeah, the like aggressive kind of style. I don't. DBP. I know he sings in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. It's not my it's not my forte, but I do. I'm like I do all styles when I do weddings. So like I can get the growl if I need it. Um, I don't know what your timeline's like. You know, I uh, I don't have a much of the a much of time, but I'd be happy to take a listen if. If if I were to come up if I were to come up with the tracks, would anybody be interested in writing to them? Yeah. Okay. He's a wordsman. So then, what I'll do, I'll I'll connect with you. Uh, can you let me put my uh, email in the chat, and if you could do yours as well, yeah, I'll put mine in there too. Uh, okay. that's, this is for I need Justin's uh, contact. Too. Justin, shoot it, my friend. Um, and then if, you know, use the forum too. Like if you need somebody's email or yeah, ask Christopher, uh, obviously we need people's consent, but yeah, Justin, were you going to ask something? Cause I, I felt like you were going to. Yeah. I had a question, but they're installing a new AC unit at my house. So I had to hop out there and talk to the guy, but I just, it's, it's not a big deal. I just had a question about where he sees logic going in the future, mm -hmm. um, with everything going on as far as producers, and, and this, the climate of everything with, you know, producers getting everything easier, loops, things like that. You know, what does he predict logic being, you know, two years from now? Wow, that would have been great. So, that been great. but unfortunately I had to get pulled away for a minute. So uh, it's all good. Uh, I will tell you, it's going to be automated. I, I don't know. I don't know where he would see it, but I, I'm letting you know, like everything is going to become much more automated. It's interesting because I started on Logic 8 and it was pretty bare bones at that point and seeing the progression to 10.5 and how much easier it's gotten for like an entry level producer to step in and make really good music. And he touched on that. He, he talked a lot about how like, you know, nowadays the climate's changed and, you know, it's kind of easier for anyone to step in and produce, you know, produce music. So I'm just curious as to, you know, where does he see Logic going? Yeah, from it's funny, real quick, uh, Tune Track, they do Easy Drummer, they do like, they have a lot of plugins. Yep. They just released like a bass plugin and it's pretty automated. It's, it's, it, it, it sounds so real. It sounds so realistic, the lines. Yeah. So yeah, man, uh, it's, it's going to be, be a fun ride, especially if you know what you're doing and if you take the crap seriously and if you're not just dragging in a bunch of loops. Yeah. Um, uh, anybody else want to make sure everybody's good? Good. I'm a Cubase user, but I'm trying to pick up little things here and there. I'm learning yeah. little tidbits here and there. I want to incorporate Ableton into my Cubase somehow. Cause that, that's okay, Angelina, too. but please don't make things too complicated, whatever you do. Okay. Like make, make sure <laughs> that the technology is not hampering you because I see it too much. It's like people should be writing three, four songs a week or whatever it is, two songs everybody has. And they're, they're spending like way too much time learning and troubleshooting. This is why in, in the modules, I have a troubleshooting day, right? Once a week or once every two weeks, you spend time doing what you're talking about. But don't spend time doing that today when you should be writing for Beth. You know, yeah, you should be. I'm, I'm telling you. Like it, I, I expect you to write for Beth and to, and to pitch for Beth. Do you sing, Angelina? She sings so yeah, good. Sing. So good. Oh, put your, send your stuff. You want to put your stuff? Uh, well, you can put it in the chat or you can put it in the form, wherever you want, Angelina. What genre do you sing, Angelina? Uh, kind of like 
like Chardonnay a little bit, smooth vocals. Uh, indie ooh, vocals. we just have ooh. It's cool. very good. Yeah. Cool. Very good. <laughs> Do you write also? Yeah, I write and play all my instruments and play bass and get, get guitar is my main instrument. Um, yeah. So, so if I were to sing some tracks, would you be interested in maybe writing to them if you feel like it was a good fit for you? Uh, I could try. Okay. That's All good right. for me. <laughs> Real quick, y'all, if, if y'all haven't, haven't listened to the modules on song structure for licensing, y'all got it. I would listen to it multiple times, take notes, and get that in your soul because that is some of the best um, for if you want to work fast, you got to have your structure down, and it's it's yeah. it's it's great stuff, man. So this is in module three, right? Or module two? I, I forget. Three. That's this. That's this uh, week's module stuff. Okay, cool. So yeah, there, there, there's a whole video series on the song structures, and I, I laid it out. Um, so yeah, thank you for that, Jacques. Appreciate you, man. Um, okay, well, have a wonderful Monday. I'll see you guys Wednesday for mixing. And uh, many blessings to each and every one of you. Thank, Thank you, brother. Thanks, Eddie.